the title of my, my presentation is the opportunities with singleton imaging um, internationally and locally and, and uh, I had a hard time uh, figuring out what to put in this presentation because uh, there's so much you can do um, and uh, I mean we have been, been, been talking about functional and, and uh, anatomical imaging and we've been talking about uh, um, well, uh, in vivo imaging, ex vivo imaging, and, and really depending on what you want to do and what you want to see, you can use different methods. And the synchrotron, well, it's just a source of x rays, and you can do well, anything depending on which beamline you go to. So I've, I've tried to put together some slides to give you some idea of, of well, some examples. Um, the next presentation after me is, is Goran. We'll be talking more about uh, imaging and hopefully also a bit of uh, in vivo imaging. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll try to, to, to cover some uh, topics of, of what is possible. So first of all, the, uh, yeah, the, the facilities, I mean, uh, we have the, uh, the symmetry here nearby, uh, Max 4, um, and um, there is uh, um, some possibilities there for, for, for imaging. Um, not so much, uh, for, for sure, no in vivo imaging yet, at least. Um, and for, for uh, micro CT, uh, there are some beamlines that are coming online now. So uh, in the next uh, year or so, uh, we will have more um, opportunities to do um, microtomography at, at the single uh, here. But in the meantime, we can also use uh, other facilities such as the uh, ESRF in, in Hanover, uh, Picto 3 that's in Hamburg, Diamond that's near uh, Oxford in the UK, Soleil is in, in Paris, in France also the uh, SLS, uh, here's the uh, Swiss. The light source where uh, Google is uh, traveling in from. And uh, yeah, here's our own uh, neighbor here, Max Four. Um, <clears throat> so, um, as I said, a synchrotron is just really a source of, of X rays. So, we have a, a big storage room here at Max Four. And uh, one possibility to do uh, in vivo imaging would be a, a medical uh, biomedical imaging beamline. So, that's the proposal that we have um, in the um, the, the roadmap of the Max 4 development, but it's not a beamline that exists uh, yet. Um, in the meantime, there are other beamlines that can be used. So there's a Danmax beamline here, where you can do imaging. There is uh, the Nanomax beamline here, where you can do um, micro and nanoprobed uh, imaging. Um, and then there are other beamlines for um, approaching crystallography and uh, spectroscopy. So you can do all sorts of things, and any of those could be related to, to drug development and, and recovery. Um, so, um, well, the title is imaging of this uh, workshop, so I will focus on, on imaging. But just to say that that spectroscopy uh, and, and crystallography, of course, are the tools that are available. At the um, so what's, what's the difference between using um, uh, synchrotron radiation rather than, than normal X-ray tubes and the other imaging methods that, that uh, we just introduced us to? Um, well, uh, it's my crash course in physics. One slide on what's what's happening with uh, with X rays. Um, so basically, um, when you have the X rays coming in, uh, well, we can have uh, absorption and we can have scattering in the material. Um, so that basically gives us some attenuation of the X ray beam, and that will give us a normal X ray image that we see uh, in the clinic. So using a, a normal clinical CT scanner or micro CT scanner. Um, but other things happen as well. Um, so we can get a phase shift of the X incoming X rays, and we can get um, uh, fluorescence also from from this. So, uh, so there are other possibilities of doing imaging. And, uh, and basically when you have a, a well-behaved source of X-ray radiation, like you do at the synchrotron, then you have many more possibilities of, of getting nice images out. Um, so, uh, so that's just to say that that's, that's actually some, some physics behind uh, going to new imaging modalities. Um, so one, one opportunity is, is really just to do um, micro CT, but just better, higher resolution, better contrast. Uh, so the contrast would come from using the, the wave properties of, of the X-ray wave. And then I mean, the high resolution is just because you have much more photon flux and, and, and higher um, resolution detectors. So uh, here's a recent study from Nature Methods that came out in the end of last year, um, where they have been, been, been imaging different uh, types of tissue, uh, lung, brain, kidney, spleen, heart, uh, and to really, really high resolution. So they have been imaging the entire organ, but then with very high resolution, so you can really zoom in and get all the information you want. Of course, this is um, not an in vivo method. Uh, this would deliver very high uh, dose uh, rates. Um, 
and um, and the data sets here are also really big because again if you have very high resolution of a very big volume then of course the, the data is just large so um so uh, it's, it's a it's a very um, powerful demonstration of, of what you can do uh, with synchrotron imaging um, in terms of micro CT. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I mentioned uh, the, the physics a few times, and I'm not talk about this just to say that, that we can use the X rays not only as these beams of particles, but actually look at them as, as, as waves and get a refraction and, and, and use this to, to get better um, contrast. Um, so what, what type of uh, research can we do? What type of, of, of um, data do we get out? Um, so one thing is, is um, that we, uh, we can do uh, virtual sectioning, so we don't need to physically uh, slice uh, our samples. Um, so um, instead of, uh, well, comparing to the, to the normal histology, um, where we would need to physically slide in, in, in thin slices to the cutting, uh, then we can, we can image um, the entire volume and get this uh, uh, virtual section, you can section in, in any direction you want. Um, so what could this be used for? Well, this can be used for, for obtaining a much better understanding of three-dimensional structures. So this is an example from, from, from Cardin. Uh, um, we have a sexy foundation in the lungs and from, I think it's from pulmonary hypertension. Um, but I mean, the, the getting the 3D information to high resolution is, is really something where we're just just doing normal micro CT, but one step further so we can do even better resolution, even better contrast. So as you said, Leo, it's just the next step that we can do with this. Um, and, uh, and then of course, when we have all of this information, we can also do data extraction. So we can, we can do statistics. Um, so this is an example here in, in, the, in the corner is uh, some axons um, where we can measure the diameter and, and the, the, the shape of these axons uh, for individual axons, and then we can extract uh, all this data from uh, the entire volume. So, so we get lots of, of data out that we can do statistics on. Um, so um, better statistics and, and better uh, volumetric understanding of, of, uh, of uh, microscopic structures. Um, these are the, I think, the main advantages of doing uh, singleton-based microscopy. Um, so when I say microscopy, it's kind of opposed to, to, the, to the in vivo imaging. Um, I don't know if there's a clear distinction between um, well, microscopy, if it has to be ex vivo or in vivo. Um, but of course, it's, it's, it's where we, we, um, we would normally use other types of microscopy, so either visible light or electron microscopy or, or um, uh, I mean, other methods for, 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 for looking at structures that are well, in, the, in the micrometer range. Um, so, so this is a, a method we need to do, um, to do this in, in three dimensions. So I, uh, I, I looked a bit at, at, the, um, at the, the workflow and going from, from in vivo imaging and, and into um, using what would be used as synchrotron radiation. So we can use the, uh, the, the synchrotron for, for in vivo uh, micro CT. And then maybe the resolution limit there would be uh, a micron or a few microns, because then we get into the problem of too high um, radiation dose. Um, if you want to go to, to higher resolution and do microscopy, so then we have to um, usually uh, do it ex vivo. And then we are in, in this workflow here of, of well, normally when we do um, microscopy, this is what we do, where we extract some, some, some tissue and we dehydrate and embed in some medium uh, to do paraffin. And then we slice it, but just before the slicing, we could do this uh, X-ray microtomography and get the volumetric information, and then we can continue with our work. So we do the slicing and do visible light microscopy, and we can even do uh, X-ray fluorescence microscopy also of thin slices. So that's the um, method that I didn't um, talk so much about yet, but that would uh, I will come back to the uh, the fluorescence uh, based imaging. I have one example here. Um, a corroded plaque, uh, so uh, an ongoing study. Um, here is to show you the difference between um, micro CT with and without the phase contrast. So just using the, the, the high coherence of the X-ray beam we had at the synchrotron, we can do phase extraction. So this would be the, the image to the left is without the phase retrieval. So basically only looking at the um, normal attenuation. And then you see the, the difference in the contrast you gain from being at the synchrotron where we have this high coherence in the X-ray beam. 
Um, so we get, get really uh, a lot of uh, contrast in the soft tissue, um, which is of course a big an advantage when we, I mean, the, the image we saw before from the, from the um, looking at the bones in the micro CT, well, that's something you can do because the bones have good contrast to the soft tissue. But if we're wanting to see features in the soft tissue, then we need to have this, uh, this phase contrast. Um, and uh, while well, here in the example of, of corroded plaque, well, we have been, been doing uh, MRI uh, images of the, of the extracted plaques. So, so this is uh, human plaques that have been extracted. Um, and we can see, uh, well, the resolution is somewhat limited. Um, and then we'll go to the, to the simulator and do um, micro CT. We can image again the entire blood plaque. So this is a diameter of five millimeters or something like this. And then we can zoom into regions that we find interesting. So uh, maybe the contrast here is not so good in particular with the, with the sunlight coming in. Um, it's more clear here. So we can really zoom in and, and get cellular resolution in the intact sample. So, so without physically slicing it. Um, well, well, it's carotid plaque. Yes. Can you explain. Uh, ah, it's, it's, it's from the uh, carotid artery from the patient. So when you have a uh, plaque here, um, then patients are operated uh, to, to remove the risk of, uh, of, of the rupture of the plaque. And, and the, uh, the plaque that has been taken out of the patients, these are stored in the uh, biobank. So we can, can study them um, without uh, any ethical problems with, with the patients. And it's actually these samples here are from, from living patients but have been, um, been removed. Um, yeah, so here's a bit better resolution. So, so you can see here in this study, we have uh, the entire um, plaque that has been removed from the patient. There's a total length here of, uh, well, uh, three centimeters or more. And then we can do um, a high resolution study where we image the entire thing. And then we can zoom in on, on smaller regions and do even higher resolution um, to study uh, particular regions. So, so here's a, a, a corner where there's a risk of a rupture. We can look at the um, at the exact morphology here and compare it then to histology. So afterwards, we can do the slicing and then we can do the, the normal uh, staining and so on in histology, and then we can do a one-to-one -one comparison of, of our um, uh, symmetry data. So I would say that this is this is a, a direct um, extension of, of micro CT, but just with better contrast, better images, higher resolution. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, we can, uh, because we have the, the volumetric information, uh, besides comparing to the 2D slices that we can do in histology, then we can also make, uh, make um, renderings and, and videos. I think we have to a video. So what you see when we're going through this, this volume here, um, this layer here is, uh, is an um, elastic membrane. Um, and when we can image this in multiple slices, uh, then we can, we can Segment it out and, and do a visualization to, uh, to, to see the, the three dimensional morphology of these um, structures. So, so, this is a, uh, the membrane, as I said, I have another example of um, uh, neo vessels. Um, so, again, this is uh, the, the, the corner here of, of the, uh, the trumbus. And inside here, we can see lots of different structures. There's um, well, uh, many different, uh, I mean, Necrosis and and uh, and, sweat. and there's also a region here where there has been uh, new vessels forming, so we can uh, can segment out these new vessels and image them, and we can then get an idea of where do the vessels come from and where do they go to. Something that's completely impossible to see with um, with this just two D slicing. Um, and this was done without any uh, staining of the sample. And then uh, the last half of my presentation will be on, on, on fluorescence imaging. So basically uh, using this other method that when we're exciting uh, the atoms in the, in, the, um, in the sample with our x-rays, well then we, um, we can also get x-ray fluorescence out. Um, this is also a very powerful method. And, and again, it's, you can compare it to, to a fluorescence microscopy that you know with visible light. Um, except that here, well, we're both sensitive to, to the elements that are already there, and we can also mark with, with specific markers and, and, and look for particular elements um, in this way. So, so here, this is stuff from the Australian simulator. Um, so it's a tadpole, and here they're imaging sulfur, selenium, and zinc. 
in this color coding here, so a red, and blue, and green, uh, to, um, to look at the distribution of, of these elements in, in the tadpole. Um, but um, uh, I will show you some, some more examples from, from, uh, from our studies here as well. So the, what you need to be aware about uh, in, in, in these um, X-ray fluorescence is that this is now um, no longer full field imaging, but it's a scanning probe. Um, so we're focusing now the X-ray beam to a small spot and that's the scanning, and then um, we can get uh, fluorescence out in the very same way that you can also do with, with uh, electron microscopes, by the way. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we rest the scan our sample, and then we can have a fluorescence detection and get these, these images out. And at the same time, we can also uh, record the transmission, so we get also the X-ray transmission images. Um, so here's again, uh, from the same sample as before, there's a periodic uh, flat. And then after we have done the sectioning and, and uh, the histology, then we can identify regions that we want to, um, to look at with, uh, with high resolution um, X-ray fluorescence microscopy. And, uh, and then we can map out. So here's one particular region, the, the, the S1 region here. And we see the, S, the image up here to the right, that's the X-ray transmission. So we see there's something that will show up in the microscopy image as, as a uh, calcification. So these are some um, uh, absorbing structures. And they are, sure enough, uh, mostly calcium, but also a lot of iron, we can see. Um, and we can see the distribution of uh, zinc and sulfur and, and, uh, and other elements. Um, that are there um, um, without uh, adding any, any staining. So this is, uh, I mean, the images up here have been stained, but, but this is a neighboring slide that hasn't, has not been stained. Um, and, and they're quite specific, uh, that's a high uh, stability and, and high, um, uh, what's it called? It's very sensitive, high sensitivity. So this is uh, measured out in many femtograms for, for micrometer square. Um, I don't know if that corresponds to in, in a millimolar or a, a micromolar, but, uh, but it's something that, that can be figured out because it's a quantitative method. Um, and then uh, there's a resolution here. Uh, now when we're doing the scanning probe and it's extreme, well, then we can also go to, to very high resolution. So, so we can do um, uh, psychographic imaging. So this is a uh, work also seven years ago now. Um, well, they have been, been doing uh, high resolution imaging of a single cell and then inside the single cell mapping out the distribution of uh, phosphor, potassium, calcium, and uh, sulfur. Um, so again, uh, it's, um, I don't know if you would call it functional imaging, but it's, it's at least distribution of, of the uh, elements that are involved in, in the functions in the cell. Um, so, uh, and then you can you can do this both in, in, in 2D and, and you mix them into uh, three dimensions of the very distribution. Um, I, uh, I just threw in this slide as well during the, uh, the, the morning session um, because uh, there was some talk about uh, um, staining. So this sample here has been stained with, uh, with osmium, um, but you could do also staining with, with gadolinium and, and look at where does the gadolinium end up if we have uh, done some, some uh, MRI based, and then we can see if the gadolinium is sitting inside the cells, outside the cells, and where they're actually sitting. So, so this is um, well, osmium staining because it, the sample was made for electron microscopy. Um, and these are axons. So again, it's, uh, it's like the, uh, the nerves that I showed you in one of the previous slides. They have been cut, uh, and and, uh, and then been, in these thin sections that bring the image at the um, nanomax line with the fluorescence. And again, we can look at other, other elements as well. Um, and, uh, and as I said, extend this into to three dimensions, so we can do um, scanning for uh, imaging of a specimen that has not been been cut, uh, but rather been been punched to some smaller size. Um, so uh, samples that are well, millimeter in diameter on this range, um, you can actually do mapping uh, in three dimensions of the elements and see the distribution. Uh, Let's see here which elements are yeah, yes. uh, you that have silicon, phosphorus, chlorine, calcium, magnesium, all different kinds of elements that you can, uh, can map out. Um, and uh, yeah, I think this is um, what I, what I chose to, to include for now, but I mean, as I said, you can do anything where you could do spectroscopy. You can also, when you have a scanning probe, so you can raster scan and do imaging as well. 
So there are many of these methods that are not only spectroscopic, but also imaging methods if you if you choose to do it like that, um, and that you can do it two different ways. And um, yeah, so basically, uh, visualization in 3D and, and element specific visualizations, these are some of the key points that you can, can really benefit from from single visualization. <coughs> Thanks a lot. Um, we have uh, two excellent questions from chat uh, from, uh, from our online audience. Iran, a uh, PhD student from uh, medical faculty, asks, I um, was wondering about volumetric analysis, if it is really accurate since the processing also causes tissue shrinkage. Is there a method to normalize for that shrinkage? Um, yeah, the shrinkage comes from from the fixation. I mean, so uh, um, so because one one obvious answer to that is is to do the imaging before uh, before doing the fixation, which is also possible. So it's possible to do on frozen tissue. It is yes, yeah. So I mean, in most of these studies, we're doing it on, on the samples that are um, already uh, fixated and in paraffin, because these are the samples that are accessible to us in the biobank. Mm -hmm. And so they're very easy to, to get, get, get access to. Um, but it's perfectly possible to do it also on, on fresh or frozen samples. I mean, so it's there is a cross the top on, during the measurement. That I mean, if you need to be frozen during the measurement, you would need to have a cryo setup, but that's um, something can be fixed. Mm -hmm. so there is another question. Mm -hmm. So, wonder if it is safer to use synchrotron to image patient compared to PET or CT. Well, I mean, um, imaging patients, uh, you cannot do it at this high resolution in any case. Uh, so, so you are you're really limited by by the radiation dose. Um, so, uh, so there are, I mean, for instance, in the synchrotron in, in Grenoble, they have been doing uh, um, imaging of patients. Um, and, and sure enough, because you have the synchrotron beam, you can choose a single energy and you can be more um, more dose efficient because you only, um, well, you get rid of all the, the low energies that, that would cause uh, a radiation dose. Um, so uh, so there are some uh, studies showing this, but um, but I think most synchrotrons say that, that, that they're not uh, meant for, for, for patients. So it's, it's a bit big hassle to get living patients to, the, to go to the synchrotron. Now we have questions from audience, please. Um, I was just uh, wondering, well, this is very cool, but I was just wondering, like, what is the, the main advantage of this technique uh, against the, the, or in front of the regular uh, stain procedures? You just showed that the black, there was not so much difference. At some point, you need to distinguish, for example, certain cells that the x-rays will not be able to see. I, I think that the, the, all of the methods have their own uh, advantages. And they, they are all unique in the sense that, that if there's a particular thing you want to see, then that's probably a method that can show you that. Um, but the point is here that, well, I mean, if you're doing uh, slicing, then, um, well, then you, you don't get the free information. Um, for the plaque, for instance, you cannot really slice it because if you have classifications, the classifications will be pulled by the knife and destroy the slices. So there's a high risk that you break the tissue. So basically, what you do is, is you decalcify the tissue before slicing it, and then you cannot see you know, well, where was the calcium. Um, but when you do uh, a non destructive imaging uh, without cutting, then, then you can see the distribution of the calcium. Uh, so that's one example. Um, but what's holding the community back to not use this? Uh, I think what is what is holding, I mean, the, the, the major barrier is that. Um, it's a little bit difficult to get access when you don't know what it is and what to do and how to do it. I mean, I think that's basically why we did today uh, to lower that barrier so that we can get more people to start because it, it's, it's really um, not so difficult. Yeah, that's true. Martin and I have been working with Lung together. And I think when you're working on branch structures like the lung, uh, which is difficult to understand from a 2D section. The field of view that we get with the synchrotron, we can get really high resolution in the cube that's 3.5 millimeters times 3.5. So, I mean, you can follow vessels over some distance and you can see 
details even in vascular walls uh, in this tube. And then you can section, and then you can do in situ hybridization or, or staining signals chemistry and, and integrate it into the. Yeah, I'm just curious about your uh, or the thinking at, at Max 4 when it comes to, to your image and being wired in some environment. If, if you want to do tomography, for example, in the ambulance without embedding, what limitations or restrictions do you have there? Well, I mean, I, I, I think at, at Max 4, um, uh, well, we have put in a proposal to have this uh, biomedical imaging beamline, and, and it has gone through the the, uh, the, the whole proposal system of, of Max4, and they have a roadmap, and this beamline is at the top of the priority list. Um, so, so basically, what is missing now is, is funding um, to, to build it, which is a significant project. Um, but, um, but I mean, it's, it's perfectly possible, and, and, and there's definitely a will to do it. Um, and right next to, to Max 4 is the, uh, the CMU uh, Animal House. So there will be a, a really uh, very good <coughs> possibility to, to have uh, that exchange between the Animal House and, and the Simulator. Um, so I think it's something that's perfectly possible. Um, but then we're with large animals and large, large species. Well, I mean, I think the large animals is probably rodents. Well, uh, like live animals. Live animals, yeah. 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 So ex excised tissue and <coughs> smaller animals. Got some skin with rhino, for example. Yeah, I mean, um, if, if, if it's uh, excised, then it's much easier to handle, of course, which is uh, why that's what we're doing now. We can we can easily bring the samples to other things so we can, we can use that. I mean, it's just easier, yeah. but but it's definitely possible to do in the imaging uh, also for some reason. So if I, if I go for Dalmax, for example, no. Uh, no, at, at Danmax, they don't have the possibility to, to handle uh, living animals. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's possible. Uh, so, so they're taking proposals now, I think, right, at Danmax? Absolutely. And so, uh, this, this has also been a, a discussion for Danmax. I mean, it was quite clear that they can do it, but now they also have, because Danmax has also been built as a material side of the it is quite clear that it is quite a large increase in large animals, especially in Denmark. So, so the direction of the imaging plan for Denmark has changed somewhat to include life sciences. But if you have a beeline that has to have that again, it becomes rather difficult. And this is why it's so important to have a beeline for life sciences. Well, actually, the idea was that you would have, that you would have two end stations uh, with two different resolutions and that can accommodate life studies, but also uh, not tissue based studies. And then to complement it also with the other defense that we have, nanomax and the soft mass that we have, that go more into the cellular ones. So, what you can really look at. Really that that was some beautifully shown volume. Last question. Yeah, I think, thank you. It's a very nice presentation, Martin. Very nice data. Uh, and um, so I can appreciate you setting up uh, the experimental conditions for the character study. It takes a long time. But my question is once it is established, Established. What is the feasibility to use that method to scan through the different samples of the, the, the biobank that is, exists? I mean, is it feasible to look at many? What's the time length for the analysis? Can you describe that a little bit? Thank you for that question. So, having, I mean, uh, no, I mean, I'm not working with Travis Plax, we're working with Lund, and Simon Plax, and Simon Plax, and Go with Martin to contact. Um, we have 40 hours of being time. We can scan the hardware higher than blocks. Okay, so um, you can do it Yeah. And then we scan maybe three areas per block. Uh, then we usually section on the top uh, section to look in the microscope and decide, okay, this area we would like to focus on. And it's, um, and it's we get a lot of data. It's fast. I would say this is definitely feasible, and, and I mean, 
So right now you're going through the, the normal proposal round. So it's every half year we apply for bean time and then you get bean time half a year later. Um, but I mean, it seems to be also imaginable that you could, could do this on a, on a faster track. I mean, many students is like coming up with different proposal schemes so you can get, get uh, easier access to the to, um, don't have to wait half a year. One of the scans that we do took maybe two minutes, yeah. three minutes, uh, with the resolution we want at the moment. And um, with a micro seat, you could get close to that in some setups, but it will take overnight. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, we have more time in the yeah. panel discussion. So, yeah, uh, please keep questions for, uh, for the panel discussion. And um, Martin, thanks a lot for your talk. Right now, I'm...